Thanks for coming, and thank you also Cabrillo Marine Aquarium for having me out here today to hear me ramble. Um, my name is Kelly Stromberg, and I'm the hatchery manager for Catalina Sea Ranch, which you will learn more than you ever want to know here in a little bit about that. And I want to tell you guys about aquaculture and what it is to have a fight for our local seafood. So just by a show of hands here, how many of you guys eat seafood? That's awesome. Perfect. Now those people, how many of you guys eat shellfish, primarily bivalve? So your mussels, oysters. Good. Well, hopefully for tonight, those of you that didn't raise your hands, shame on you. And hopefully I'll persuade you <laughs> to start eating seafood, primarily bivalves, uh, by the end of this chat. And the ones that don't eat bivalves, well, you've got to start. So whenever you go to a grocery store or a restaurant or anything and you order seafood, probably you don't really think about where it comes from, is it sustainable, what even sustainability means. But it is something that is a very big concern, not just here locally, but it's also globally a concern. Locally, we actually import 91% of our seafood, and that leads to the U.S. having an $11 billion seafood deficit. So we are actually losing money here in the United States from bringing in other shellfish from other countries. It's also a global concern because most of our world is malnutrition. About one in nine people on the planet are malnourished, and by 2050, about a billion people will be suffering from chronic malnutrition. So if you look at this chart here, which I don't know how easy it is to see the persons up there, um, this is a hunger map of this year around the world as to what percentage of each country is suffering from malnutrition. The light greenish kind of yellow color is all under 5% under of the population. The light orange is anywhere from 5 to almost 15%. The darker orange, 15 to 25% almost. Red, 25 to almost 35%. And that maroon color, 35 to over 40%, or 35 and over. So what I want you guys mostly to focus on on this map is if you look at Africa, most of their country is all anywhere from 25 to over 35% uh, malnourished. And China has about, or is moderately low, with only 5 to 15%. That will come in play later. If you also look at our growing population, it's growing every year. So if you look at the really colorful map on your right, <laughs> um, the yellow it looks, or is under 1% of uh, population growth each year. The green, 1 to almost 2% each year. Purple, 2 to almost 3 and red over 3%. Again, I want you to look at Africa. All of Africa almost is completely, or is growing anywhere from two to over 3% every year in their population. China, which is another key point, which I'll bring up on the next slide, but they're growing one to 2% every year. So fast forward to the year 2100, Africa will have grown 242% and Asia, 9%, and us here in the North America, 51%. So if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, you'll see a direct correlation, once again, in Africa. Not only are they the fastest growing population in the world, but they're also the most malnourished. And China, which keep in mind from a previous slide, we import 52% of our seafood from, they are growing up to 2% and are already moderately low being malnourished. So what do you think is going to happen whenever they start realizing we're exporting 52% of our seafood and our own country is malnourished? They're probably going to stop exporting to us, huh? So with us importing 91% of our seafood, it's definitely a concern and something that we need to think about. How do we feed our own economy and others? With the world being 70% ocean, or water, you would think that we could just go out and fish. However, obviously this has been something we've thought of before, just fish the ocean and feed the public. So if you look at between years 1950 and 2014, we have actually reduced the Pacific bluefin tuna to where only 5% remain, sharks only 10% remain since then, and 5% of North Atlantic cod remain. Pretty bad. And it's not just those species, 
but it's the total fisheries. So this map right here, if you look at the red pyramids, that's species of fish that live in a rich ecosystem. The black triangles represent all fish in all ecosystems. And the blue triangles represent species of fish that live in poor ecosystems. And as you can see, they're all doing pretty well back in 1950. Pretty diverse, they're all swimming free in the ocean. But as our population already was increasing, we started fishing the oceans and overfishing to the point where we have almost completely diminished our fisheries down to 50% to almost 80% by the year of 2000. If we keep going like this, we'll actually, or they're predicting a total collapse of the fisheries between 2050 and 2115. So think of your grandchildren and their children. They aren't gonna have any food. So what is there to do? You aren't gonna have any more Pacific bluefin tuna. There won't be any rockfish, no Atlantic cod. No, there's delicious fish that you like to enjoy from restaurants and uh, like Wal or not Walgreens, sorry, Whole Foods. <laughs> Walgreens wouldn't be a good place to buy fish. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, we turn to aquaculture. What is aquaculture? It's the farming of animals from aquatic environments. And as Jacques Cousteau once said, we need to farm the seas like we farm the land. And I agree. And these couple pictures just so that we guys kind of know what an aquaculture facility looks like. The one here on the right with all the round pins, that's a fin fish farm, so things like your tuna or your sea bass. In the center, we have what an oyster farm would look like that does bag culture, so there's lots of oysters in those little bags. And on the left is a picture of a mussel farm, so all those lines hanging down, those are mussels attached to a rope. And as we can see, we're already kind of seeing our way of air in the past. So our map on the right in the blue shows our wild capture, which was increasing all the way up until the 90s and then started to steadily uh, plateau off. But aquaculture started taking over the lead and expanding to help feed our growing populations. This is also partially due to stricter regulations on the fisheries, thanks to or, um, places like NOAA that are seeing that. And then what we're hoping is that whereas in 2012, we were only eating about, or sorry, only 49% of our seafood was being farm raised and 51% being wild caught. What we're hoping to see is that by 2030, 62% of our seafood that we eat will be from farm raised and 38% will be wild caught. And more importantly, we wanna expand shellfish aquaculture. Already, two-thirds of the U.S. Uh, marine aquaculture is comprised of shellfish cultivation, which is one of the most sustainable sources of food on the earth. This is due primarily because shellfish already live in high dense populations. Most of you guys, if you go out to a, a pier or out on your docks or on a boat, you're probably actually kind of annoyed with these little mussels because they grow everywhere and they're usually growing in clumps. This is good though for an aquaculture facility because unlike your fin fish where you have to give them antibiotics um, to prevent them from getting diseases, these don't have diseases. They also are all over the world, which means that you would have a lower chance of introducing a non-invasive species, as well as introducing a disease or a parasite since they don't have them. They are also are a filter feeder, which means that we don't actually have to feed them like you have to do with fin fish. Fin fish, actually 60% of your operation cost is just feeding the fish, whether it be going out and catching smaller fish to then feed your fish, or feeding them soy or fish meal or wheat products. These will eat phytoplankton that's naturally in the water. They're one of the most abundant, abundant source of food in the ocean. They're little microscopic plants. So what they do is they bring them in, they filter it, actually lean, leaving the water cleaner than it was before. So here's a good video that shows how much they can actually filter. What it's doing is it shows about 20 adult mussels in a bucket. That brownish color that you see in the before picture is all phytoplankton, which is their food source. And within a couple of hours, they have completely cleaned out all the phytoplankton, leaving the water nice and clean. In fact, lots of uh, places such as Chesapeake Bay, 
that as the shellfish population started to decrease, their water actually became more polluted. So to restore that, they actually brought in shellfish into the Chesapeake Bay to clean up the water because of this excellent filter feeding skills that they have. A single mussel can uh, filter feed about 32 gallons of water a day, and an oyster up to 50 gallons a day. So they go through a lot. So we see nearshore aquaculture farms if you're driving down the coast, especially if you're up in Washington and Oregon or on the East Coast. But as our population grows, so does our, our pollution. So all of our pesticides, our miracle grow. When we walk our dog and don't pick up after them. After a big rainfall, especially here in California where we don't have a lot of rain, what do you think happens to all that? It goes straight into the water. So these shellfish farms get closed down for a while until the pollution starts to dilute, and then they can reopen. This causes a big fluctuation up and down of production and leaves you guys without food for a couple of weeks. Also, if you're living on the shoreline, you've spent these millions of dollars for a house, you don't want the eyesore of all these floats that you see here in these pictures. You want to see the ocean. That's what you paid the big dollar for. You also don't want to hear people out there with their music on and running cranes. So there's actually kind of a, a fight or a war going on, especially up in Washington, where these homeowners are trying to close down some shellfish farms so they don't have to see them or hear them. So what's the answer? We're all starving. We will starve more. We can't do aquaculture near shore. What's there to do? How about go offshore? So offshore, there's numerous advantages. You have high nutritious phytoplankton that's all offshore, more of a current. You don't have the eyesore, so all these homes on the ocean, they wouldn't be able to see you. So let's try that. The US has one of the largest EEZ zones, which it means exclusive economic zones, which means that it's the jurisdiction over natural resources, or the ocean, up to two nautical miles out. This is also prime aquaculture land, or water. So the US is one of the most ideal countries to expand their aquaculture. My boss, Phil Kruver, CEO of Catalina Sea Ranch, saw this potential after he learned about the Blue Revolution and what it means to feed our country and how we're going to do it. So he started in fighting for the permits to become the first shellfish farm in US federal waters. He was awarded the, all the permits back in January 2014, and he will be the, also the largest shellfish farm in the United States with being 100 acres. We're hoping that 100 acres will then be able to expand into 600 acres, so then we can um, eventually, will primarily be farming mussels and other shellfish since they are the most sustainable source of food. And we, are geographically located on what we call the San Pedro Shelf. So the San Pedro Shelf is this big plateau that you see out here. It's all about 150 feet deep, and it drops off then to about 3,000 plus feet. So if you see this little black dot right there, that's Catalina Sea Ranch. From here, we're about 10 miles offshore, and if you're at Huntington Beach, we're about six miles offshore. This is a prime location because, as you'll know, we are right next to that drop-off where it drops down to 3,000 plus feet. This is great for us because what happens is upwelling occurs. So nutrient phytoplankton from the deep water rushes up that cliff, giving our mussels a prime, highly nutritious phytoplankton meal. So think of, for instance, if you were in a lagoon and you were a shellfish. You're, think of your typical food pyramid. There you'd be eating mostly sugar. Maybe every once in a while you get your vegetable or your fruit. However, where Catalina Sea Ranch is, you're getting your full pyramid. You're getting loaded with vegetables, fruit, protein, kind of the works to put it in perspective. Also what this map does is it shows how much potential there is just here off our coast alone. In the US federal waters, there's 26,000 acres of water that would be ideal for aquaculture just on that one shelf alone. So that means that obviously with easements and whatnot, you could technically have the expansion to that. It won't ever become that, but it's nice to know that that possibility is there. 
Oh, and also, so federal waters is anywhere from three miles to 200 miles off the coast. So our hope is to get up to 600 acres, which would be about 17 million pounds of mussels per year, which our hope is, is that would actually reduce the imports that we bring in from Prince Edward Islands, this little teeny island up in eastern Canada, and reduce that by half. So we could technically take like the west coast, they could take the east coast, and that would reduce also our carbon footprint. So what does a mussel farm look like? So this isn't quite up to scale, but it'll give you kind of a general idea. If you were to go out to our ranch location, you won't see very much. You're gonna see four corner buoys marking where the ranch site is, and then you'll see four of what these surface floats are floating on the top. That depicts where what we call a backbone line is, and there will be 40 of those out there. A backbone is 600 feet, 30, or 600 feet long, and it's 30 feet below the surface. It's hung with subsurface floats that hang it taut, and then from there, we have muscle lines underneath that that range from 30 to 60 feet in a continuous looping pattern. So if you have 600 feet of backbone, that means that you have 12,000 feet of muscle line underneath. It times that by 40 lines. Our 100-acre ranch alone can produce 2.7 million pounds of shellfish. So that's bringing you that much more local seafood that's very sustainable. We also want to ensure that we're doing things in the most sustainable manner. So what we've started is a mariculture monitoring program where we have teamed up with many institutions such as NOAA, IOS, Scripps, Squirt, kind of everybody, <laughs> to look at how the shellfish farm is affecting our environment. So we know that shellfish are sustainable, but how sustainable? So we're going to be looking at things like pH, chlorophyll levels, harmful algae blooms, uh, benthic taxonomy, water chemistry, and also the sea life that the farm brings. Putting a whole bunch of rope out in the middle of an ocean where usually it's barren out there, it's going to act as an artificial reef. So we want to see what fish populations are moving over there and what effect that has on other communities as well. Uh, Pat Mead's already kind of told them, or talked about this, but we are looking into moving into Alta Sea and being one of the first tenants after SCMI, or Southern California Marine Institute, where one of our R&D hatcheries is currently. But we're looking into moving over there to not only doing processing, um, but also to have our own hatchery. So a hatchery that could produce enough seed to fill up a 600 acre farm. And you, sounds kind of weird, a hatchery for mussels and seed. Doesn't make sense, right? But how else are you gonna start up a ranch? Just like with any other farm, we have to produce seed or juvenile mussels. So how we do this, is mussels are what we call a broadcast spawner, which means that they release their gametes, or their sperm and their egg, into the water and hope that it matches up with the opposite. So what we have here is a video of a male. Kind of looks like it's almost smoking, and that means it's releasing its sperm. And then we also have a female over here uh, releasing their eggs. And what we do in a lab setting to get this to happen is we temperature shock them. We move the mussels from cold water back to hot water, back to cold water, and keep doing that until they release their gametes. At that point, we separate the males and the females, let them spawn, and then we combine them in kind of a baby-making cocktail. So we, mix <laughs> so we mix the eggs in with the sperm for seven sperm to one egg ratio. And just to put it in perspective, one female can produce up to six million eggs in one spawn, so it's good for us. After that spawning process, they turn into a free swimming larvae. It's kind of what you can hopefully see here swimming. Um, that's called a villager, and they'll be a free swimming larvae for about two to three weeks of their life, and then they'll want to set. Out in the wild, they want to set on a pier or a rock or something like that, but we want them so then we can put them out at the ranch. So what we do is we attach them to what we call fuzzy rope which kind of looks like a rope that's really frayed. What this does is it has the most surface area within the tank, so the muscles are naturally drawn to that fuzzy rope and attach onto it. After they become a couple millimeters, we then lift that rope out of the tank 
and just put it out at the farm. From there, they do what they would naturally do, just like anywhere else. They eat the natural phytoplankton that's in the water, and we just let them hang there until they're of size. The market size is about two and a half to three inches, and depending on where you are in the, war or in the US, depends on how long that muscle will grow. Where we are, because of that perfect food pyramid of phytoplankton, our muscles grow to be full market size in about eight months. And if you, you are in a lagoon in Southern California, it's about a year. Up in Washington and Oregon, due to the colder water, it's about 18 months. And poor PEI people, they are about two years. So they also harvest under the ice. So it's no surprise to us that climate change is starting to show its effects. We've already kind of been seeing it around. But where it's really been hitting already is Washington. This map shows kind of the prediction of when we'll really start to see it, which for us, we're lucky because it, hopefully it won't hit here until about 2071. So climate change does have a big effect on shellfish growth and their shells. So what we hope to do is we've teamed up with USC and Cal State Dominguez Hills to come up with selective breeding programs that can prepare us for these climate changes start teaching them, or not teaching them, but breeding them, so then they can adapt to that environment. So whenever 2071 hits, and our climate change starts affecting other shellfish, we'll be prepared. We have two grants to look at this. The one with Cal State Dominguez Hills is called the Sea Superb Grant, and it's worth $25,000, where we're going to look at maternal and paternal traits to sele or in selectively breed for climate change. So how we're going to do this is we're going to take mussels from up in Washington, which is used to a colder climate, and mussels from here in California, and we're going to spawn them and split the eggs into half. And then we'll take half the eggs and spawn them with a California male and half the eggs with a Washington male. We then will grow them up to full market size, observing their growth rate um, and their genetics and see what traits they're starting to show. Then on their F2 family line, so you spawn them after that again, you would then put them in different water temperatures to see how they would affect. The idea is, is we wanna know if the genes coming from the male Washington or California will allow those muscles to adapt in a different climate change, whether it be higher or lower, and if those traits are coming from the male or the female. We also have teamed up with USC, where we got a NOAA SBIR grant, which is called a Small Business Innovation, Innovation Research Grant, where a small business can team up with another institution. And that one comes in different phases. We were awarded with phase one for $95,000, which is called implementation. So you have six months to prove that you know what you're doing. And then if you get awarded phase two, you get $400,000 for commercialization. And what we're going to do is I'm working with a grad student at USC who's in the genetic and computational lab who will do a single family spawn. So that means one male, one female, you spawn them. And then we will look at their growth rates, their meat to shell ratio once they're market size, uh, their omega-3 content, all their nutrition levels. And then he can actually do the genetic sequence of each family line to pinpoint what genetic markers go along with those traits. We then will know what family lines to then further breed to have essentially the best of the best muscles we can. And I wanna stress, no, this is GMO, which means genetically modifying, it's enhancing select, or selective breeding. We also are looking into cryobanking muscle eggs, sperm, and larvae. This is something that we do with humans and other livestock. Um, however, it's never really been done in a shellfish or any aquaculture world, um, minus just a research setting. So, but this will be handy for us as a commercial use, is shellfish only spawn a couple times a year. So you get this kind of production line influx of up and down. So if we were able to cryopreserve them, not only could we produce more mussels in a single year, but we could have a steady production rate. We also are looking into doing purple hinge rock scouts, which is a native scallop here off our coast. It's known for being called purple hinge rock scallop, hence the picture with the purple hinge. 
Um, <laughs> this is an organism that has been something that researchers have looked at spawning. They have a very temperamental larval stage, as well as they act like an oyster, and that they like to set on things, so rocks and piers and things like that, versus your other scallops that you normally find at your supermarket or a restaurant that actually use their shells and clap and swim. So these, we have to figure out what can we grow these on as a substrate that we can either reuse, um, that doesn't damage the shell whenever we go to harvest, and is, works for commercial utilization. So we've teamed up with Bodega Bay Marine Institute that has a sea grant to look at these things. So we're working with Dr. Paul Olin at how do you spawn these to get the most effective spawn as well as what do we set these on so then we can make these a commercial item. We want to make these a commercial item because other scallops that you would get, a lot of dredging happens to get those, which therefore could disrupt and also have bycatch. So if you were able to grow them on, let's say, a rope like you can a mussel, that would limit any bycatch and also be a more sustainable way to eat scallops. So now you've learned all about shellfish, and you know those are sustainable, but if you're like me, I still like my local food and fish every once in a while. So how do you know that you're eating the right kind of fin fish, or shellfish even for that matter? There's farm-raised, wild-caught, and it all gets kind of confusing. So and not all farm-raised is good. There are bad farms out there that have hormones and GMOs and um, put stuff in them, but there's also good ones. Same with wild caught. If you catch them in a sustainable manner, it's fine. Like I said, it gets kind of confusing, right? So you can turn to these three different organizations. There's Community Seafood, which is a local organization that works with local fishermen to get their latest catch. This way, you can go to your farmer's market, you can pre-order it, go pick it up, either weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, you can set it up with them. So you can show up, get whatever they caught that day, it's only 48 hours or less uh, being off the boat, so you know it's nice and fresh, and you know it's sustainable. There's also resources like Seafood for the F Future, which is with the Aquarium of the Pacific, who also like to educate and teach you about where is a good place to get seafood. And then the one that's easiest for most consumers is Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, which they put it down into an easy stoplight situation. So green bean, your best choices, or go. Your yellow, good alternatives if they don't have the green. And red, avoid them altogether. So for instance, if you were to go to a Whole Foods, they actually already have this marked up. So you can go straight up to their seafood counter and they'll have tilapia, this one's a green, or a tuna. This one actually was caught sustainably, so it might be a yellow, but you know, be cautious. So it helps you make the wise choices for seafood and if you're at any other grocery store and they don't have this, they actually have an app as well you can download to help you make these choices. If you're at a restaurant, well then it's not so easy, is it? But you can always ask the chef or manager or server, whoever, for shellfish tag. All shellfish and fin fish have to come with a tag to show where they came from, when the harvest date was, um, if they were wet stored or not, uh, were they a certified grower, etc. So you can actually look at this tag and know exactly what you're eating, which is important. So as an overview, we need to expand our aquaculture to feed the world's ongoing population, more specifically aquaculture here in the US. As I stated earlier, we import 91% of our seafood. And with our growing population, we aren't gonna be able to get those imports at, anymore once population starts booming. The US also has one of the largest EEZs in the world, and therefore, we should be expanding aquaculture. And with that, reducing the imports of seafood that we have, as well as our carbon footprint. We also need to increase the amount of shellfish we eat, since it is the most sustainable source of seafood. And we, or, and we need to use our resources to source sustainable seafood from local fishermen and sustainable farms, or even wild caught, if it's sustainable. If you guys want to know more about Catalina Sea Ranch, you can always check us out on our website. And then we also have a Facebook page where we keep local updates as to 
even how spawns were going that day, how research grants are going, et cetera. We post lots of pictures, so you can always check us out on there. If you ever have any random questions about aquaculture in general or Catalina Sea Ranch, you can always email me as well. Kelly, are there some questions? Yeah, you've had a real uphill battle uh, with my wife because she says any farm fish is terrible, don't eat it, and she's not willing to educate herself. But from this, I can see that we're making progress. Mm -hmm. And I think the general public is confused. <laughs> you could say that, exactly. That's why I think a lot of these institutions such as Monterey Bay's Seafood uh, Watch and Seafood for the Future, it's kind of trying to help the general public understand the difference. There is a lot of misconceptions about a lot of shellfish farming because there are those bad farms out there that kind of give the shellfish farms and finfish farms a bad rep. But separating the shellfish from the finfish and the finfish, the salmon farming and the disease and the, all the hormones and the, mm -hmm. the antibiotics and all that stuff. It's giving every, the whole industry is that. It is. And once again, there are good fin fish farms out there that don't use any food coloring in their food and they do it in a sustainable manner. But you're right, it does kind of give the public misconceptions about farm raised food. So I think the main thing is for people to try to educate themselves as to which farms are good. Um, look at different resources such as the Monterey Bay one or the Seafood for the Future or use sources even like local seafood where you can just go pick it up. You know that it's gonna be sustainable. You don't even have to think about it. Um, but education is key here. And I'll have to admit, it's a very confusing education lesson <laughs> to kind of get a grasp of. So is someone working with the major purveyors like uh, food uh, stores, which ones are sustainable, which ones aren't? As far as like restaurants and well, not just restaurants, but food stores, Costco. Oh yeah. yeah. So a lot of food stores, even such as like Whole Foods, Costco is actually a great source. They'll only buy sustainable seafood. So once again, it's getting that awareness, and yes. these companies are starting to realize we can't keep going on in an unsustainable manner. We're going to overfish our oceans. The bad farms aren't going to be healthy for us and also further damage their ocean versus help the ocean. So a lot, of or a lot of different companies will actually promote that they only buy sustainable seafood. And the ones that don't, it's once again an education battle. Sustainable Seafood Convention is a great source for these restaurants and other uh, food suppliers to come out, see what the difference is between them, educate themselves as to why that extra 50 cents is important to spend for a farm-raised shellfish or a fin fish. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Are you going to allow fishing there? Are you <laughs> <laughs> well, it will be a good artificial reef, and right now it's still kind of up in the air a little bit, but we will allow fishing around the shellfish facility, and there is a possibility of recreational fishing being able to happen. Since the lines are 30 feet underwater, if you're a small boat craft or whatever, like your little dinghy or, you know, Chris Craft or whatever, you can drive through the farm. But as far as fishing goes, it's still working with Ag uh, Coastal Commission and other agencies to see if that's okay or not. So, to be continued on that. Any others? Yeah. If you're going to put a couple of million pounds of new food 30 feet under the water, <coughs> uh, are there no predators? I mean, how do you that. Perfect or great question. So where we are with it, the lines being 30 feet underwater, the shellfish only really have two main predators. We have schooner ducks that can dive, but with it being 30 feet, we're out of the depth range of a schooner depth or schooner duck. And we're above water, so if things like a starfish can't really crawl up the lines and have a feast as well. So we're right at that perfect kind of spot for low predation. Yes. When is this going to be operational? You said you got the permits in 2014. Uh -huh. Approximately how many workers would be on this under acre site? Sure. So right now we're hoping for this fall um, during the spawning season, which is around October, November. Um, but unfortunately, a lot relies on this monitoring that we're having to do with Coastal Commission. 
So they right now are approving our monitoring uh, procedures. And if they do approve it, we'll be a go for this fall. If they have further questions or comments that we need to alter a little bit, that might push it back, but hopefully not too much longer. We also can maybe have a hold up with investors. We do think that we're okay with the new investor that will tell us in two weeks if he'll give us the funds. But that would give us enough funds to actually start up 10 lines of our shellfish farm. And then eventually uh, we can expand it from there. But if he doesn't actually come through, then that also could be something that holds us up. So that's the trickiest question of the night probably, as to give you a set date as to when our farm would be fully operational. Can I also ask, what, what skills would, would your workers, what kind of educational skills would your workers need to, to perform at this farm? Sure, so sorry, I forgot about your second part of the question. So uh, a shellfish farm is a lot of automated equipment. So we'd probably have about five crew workers, which for their, their skill level, they would just have to be a hard worker that can deal with a lot of sun, because they'll be out on a boat all day, be able to swim, be able to lift 50 pounds or more. Um, so pretty much your basic work criteria, minus the swimming. <laughs> but um, then we'll also have people here in the hatchery, which we like to see uh, and work with grad students or other biology majors or environmental people that kind of have that skill set. Um, but for instance, I came from just a regular biology degree from Kansas. So I knew nothing about shellfish until I got into it. So I, for one, am very open to looking into helping other students if this is a career path that they like, as long as they have the willingness to do it. And then we'll also have the operational side. So somebody that gets the harvesting routine and how much needs to be harvested on any given day, kind of keep that side of things, as well as office workers. So distribution, working with other companies. Your pricing model, do you have, uh, will you immediately be competitive with other Imports. So for us, right now there's actually not enough muscles to even go around. So distributors are willing to almost pay anything. But we will be very competitive with them and try to make it so that it's an easy choice to go for us versus other choices. Uh-huh. And how about? I was just wondering, you did a comment about Costco. So for a little clarification, I see tilapia that's farmed. That's on the red list on Monterey Bay. So there is different farms of tilapia, but some are good and some are bad. Um, and that's where the Monterey Bay Aquarium watch list does kind of, once again, get a little bit confusing because some, some tilapia farms are very sustainable. So for instance, in that case, knowing that they came from a Costco that only sells sustainable food, you would know that that would be a good choice. Okay. And they, they have to do more than one column. On the left side, it says, in parentheses, farm in the U.S. is okay now, rather than Asia. Right. But, and also the same thing with salmon, because you know, publicity in and general information is that farm salmon is not the best. Yep, and see, that's another thing, is some salmon farms are also very good. So one great thing about being in the U.S. is we have some of the strictest FDA regulations as far as food goes. So us and New Zealand are some of the top-notch uh, regulatory agencies that look at our food and what's being done at these farms. So a lot of the U.S. is sustainably farmed. Uh, it's whenever we get into our imports, which unfortunately is most of our seafood, that things start to kind of get a little bit hairy. Because whereas our FDA does look at what seafood does come in, we get so much of it in that there's parts that they miss. So uh, the main thing is, is if you keep to the U.S., you're probably doing pretty good. Yeah. Uh, some shellfish farms are already having to deal with the impact of ocean acidification on the construction of the shells and the reduced amount of plankton. <laughs> What impact do you think they'll have? Because the location of your farm and its proximity to upwelling, do you think that will reduce that impact? So ocean acidification is something that will hit. That's uh, one of the slides that was up there mentioned the climate change, which is referring to this ocean acidification. So right now in hatcheries, because it really only affects the shellfish when they're in their juvenile stage and start building up their shell. So in a hatchery setting, what they're doing up north is they're actually buffering the water to be able to allow the shellfish to create that shell. So it's something that's manageable. 
And with our selective breeding program, our kind of hope is that we can kind of get ahead of it before it hits Southern California. If we can selectively breed so that way they can already be adapted to that climate change or ocean acidification, that's what we're hoping for. And the phytoplankton with us being offshore, there is more of an abundance. You have more current, you have this upwelling versus a lagoon or something that doesn't really have a lot of flow. How about you? Are you thinking about whales? Whales, no. So with whales, I've actually been uh, working with some people at NOAA who that's what they specialize in is does a whale, can they get caught in a shellfish farm or a finfish farm? And they actually know down to the exact size of rope that a farm would have that could entangle a whale. But the easy answer is, is that that whale would have to be pretty much already dead to get entangled in it. And even then it would be a pretty hard battle for it to get into. Yes. So mussels, we call kind of the weeds of the sea. You don't have to do very much with them. You spawn them, you put them out at the ocean, and then you harvest them. Whereas an oyster, we aren't looking into it right now because they take actually a lot more work. In order to get that oyster that's separate, like if you were to do an oyster shooter, you have to do this process called tumbling. So every four to six weeks, you have to go out, harvest your oysters throughout their whole life cycle, tumble them through a machine that kind of just bounces them around and knocks them apart from each other, and then put them back out to the ranch. Another four to six weeks goes, you bring them back in. So they take a lot more time. Uh, scallops, right now, a lot of people um, just do wild caught for scallops, but our hope is to get into the purple hinge rock scallops where we could uh, grow scallops in a very sustainable way. Yes? Um, mussels are known to not be a selective feeder, so when it comes to things like harmful algal blooms that are increasing, you know, they could be the first ones to have uh, higher toxin levels. So what are you doing on your farm to, to monitor that, to maybe monitor if a harmful algal bloom is, is coming to the area? Sure, good question. So any shellfish farm, especially here in the U.S., is highly regulated. So you have to do weekly tests biotoxin tests and send them into the state to see if there is any signs of a harmful algae bloom or any PSP, which means paralytic shellfish poisoning or demoic acid in the water or in the actual shellfish, shellfish itself. And on top of that, we are actually teamed up with Mabari, um, who is giving us a machine called an ESP that can detect harmful algae blooms in real time to give us a heads up if a bloom is starting to occur, which then we could ramp up how many samples we start sending in and get a head start. Unfortunately though, if there is a harmful algae bloom, there's nothing you can do except for wait. Um, the shellfish will purge it out so then it's not gonna harm you in any way, but it's just a waiting game at that point. You just keep monitoring until you see that coast is clear. Yes? I'm curious how the farm stays in place. So is it suspended out there because it's close to that shell? I mean, what, how do you keep it from sliding off into the shell? I mean, is it down. Sure, yeah, it's, it's anchored down with screw anchors. Um, so these screw anchors can actually withheld or withhold itself in a hurricane, which how many of those do we really get? Um, another good thing about these screw anchors, unlike other farms right now who use weighted down barrels or something that with the current can kind of shift or move and destroy the seafloor, these screw anchors are very set. They aren't going to drag on the seafloor or anything like that and also be able to withhold the weight of the muscle lines. And if you have an El Nino, is that good, bad, or? Negative? El Ninos are bad. Um, <laughs> not just for shellfish, but in general for the oceans. Um, but it's something that you just have to stick through. Um, one way to kind of help with that is maybe keep them in a hatchery longer, so that way they kind of get through that first initial stage. But yeah, it's, it's not a good thing, so hopefully this will pass fast. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, tell me more about the label that you said that, that you could ask for. Does all fish that come into the United States or produced here have that label? Uh -huh. And that was, you know, was it did that? Or? Uh, it's regulated by the state or the country that it comes from. So here in California, for instance, if, we were to, if you were to get a bag of mussels, you would get one of those tags in it, and it would say, if it was our mussels, Catalina Sea Ranch, Harvest Date, 8615. Um, let's see, our 
uh, certified grower identification number, which usually looks like a RS, couple digits, SS or something like that afterwards, so you know it's a certified grower. Um, so it can tell you exactly when it was left or left the farm, if it's called or if it's gone through what we call wet storage. So let's say I brought in mussels from Canada and I wanted to juice them back up essentially. So since they've been out of water, they've lost some of their water. If I want to put them back in water, kind of boost them up with some more water, they can drink a little bit, kind of revitalize a little bit from their trip and then sell it again, that's what wet storage is. So if you see that on a label, that means it came from a place after it was harvested. It was put back in the water for a couple days, which the water would be certified as well, and then re-harvested again to go out to the consumer. What about fin fish? Like, you know, would it say where the tuna was caught? So fin fish, unfortunately, I'm not as aware of as I am shellfish. Shellfish is definitely more my expertise. So I unfortunately can't answer a good answer on that, and I'm sorry. But I can find out if you want, um, you can email me and I can find out the answer from a shellfish grower and let you know for sure. Anybody else? No? Thank you very much, Kelly.